new to the data space or not so new. You just want some clarity on the word ETL. You've been hearing words such as ETL. Is ETL. ETL pipeline. Is ETL. Is ETL data warehouse. Or data pipeline. Basic data pipeline. A data pipeline and here we're the data pipeline. Or data job being thrown around everywhere on YouTube, on the internet or at your workplace. So you're like, what the hell does EGL mean? Can someone please already explain it to me like I'm five? Good thing. In the next few minutes, you'll have all the clarity we need about the word EGL pipeline. Let's jump in. <music> Hey there everybody, my name is Saurav, Asha Kurchi, Tumra Shabai Bhalo Acho, meaning I hope you are doing well today. And in this video, we are going to be discussing number one, what actually is an ETL pipeline? And number two, we'll discuss the components of an ETL pipeline. First up, what is an ETL pipeline? Well, in simple words, an ETL pipeline is a process that moves data from one place to another. So there's this place where the data that we want exists or is generated at. Let's call it a source. And we want to move that data to our destination. And whatever intermediate steps, aka transformations, that we need to perform in order to move that data from the source to the destination is called a data pipeline or an ETL pipeline or an ETL job and so on. So if you had to break down a data pipeline into components, there would exactly be three of them. Number one, source. Number two, destinations. And then number three, the intermediate steps known as transformations. Now for better context, let's take a closer look into the three components, starting with the source. Sources. All right, let's discuss some typical data sources that a data engineer has to deal with. Starting with the first one, the SFTP server. This is the most common way of sharing data. The data provider, it could be a data vendor or some external team or maybe an internal team within our organization who has a process that creates data files that are uploaded to a server known as the SFTP server. Now, how do we data engineers set all of these up? Well, the data engineer typically meets with the provider and decides on things like who will host the SFTP server? Is it going to be us or the provider? what would the file name be and the format of the file be? Format meaning, will it be a CSV file or an Excel file or something else? What attributes or columns are going to be in the file? And if possible, a data dictionary, which will have the definitions of those attributes. What directory in the server will the files be dropped at? I remember at my very first job after school, I was in one of these meetings with a data provider and I had no clue about what to say or what to ask for. Of course, I slowly figured it out, but you don't have to be like that because you're watching this video. Aww. Now, once we have all of those questions ironed out, then the engineer would build a job or a program that would automatically get the data from the SFTP server. Another popular way of sourcing data is from API servers, which is actually becoming more and more popular nowadays. Now, unlike an SFTP server, we do not have to set up an actual API server. Instead, in order to get the data, we send requests, API requests to an API server. And this API server responds to our requests with API responses. Pretty simple, isn't it? Now let's quickly look at what are all the things that we need in order to interact with API server. Number one, API endpoints. So we need to know what API endpoint to hit in order to get the response back. Number two, API credentials. In order to communicate, we need to set up an API key and secret for authentication purposes. Number three, response structure. So once we hit the API server with a valid request, we receive a response from the server. And this response actually has the data we need. Now we need to know the structure of the response so that we can actually parse it and store it appropriately. Typically, the response structure information and other details such as API limits can be found in the API documentation. And typically, a data engineer would use Python's super popular request library to parse it. Now about API designs. There are two types, REST and SOAP. Responses from a SOAP endpoint are rigid and highly structured. And that's why they're on the decline nowadays. Whereas REST endpoint responses are flexible. REST is that's why more popular in the industry nowadays. 
Now, what are some good examples of API? Well, Google APIs are super popular. YouTube API, Facebook API, Fitbit API. I mean, there are just so many of them. All right, let's move on to webhooks. Now, webhooks are reverse API. Now, with APIs, the engineer or the engineer's code sends a request when it needs to. It pokes the provider asking for the data. The actual data may or may not have changed since the last time a call was made, but the provider will always respond back with the data whenever it's requested for it. So webhooks are similar to APIs in most ways, except that you don't need to request the data at all. The provider would automatically send you a response when something changes in the data that you're interested in. Webhooks are typically used for creating real-time data pipelines, also known as streaming pipelines. The final type of data source that we're gonna to discuss today is web scraped data. Now, if you've been a data engineer for a while, you would have come across a time when you'd had to scrape web pages now, as the name suggests, web scraping is used to scrape large amounts of HTML data from websites. Nowadays, there are tools available that would do it for you, but if you really wanted to, you could still write all your code by hand in Python. So those were some of the most popular sources of data that data engineers use to build data pipelines. If you get a chance to spend four to five years in the industry, you would definitely would have worked on all of these data sources at least once. Next, let's look at some destinations. So broadly, there are two to three types of destinations, starting with the first one, the data lake. Now, data lakes are an object storage service in cloud like AWS S3 and Azure Blob Storage. Now, you can think of a data lake to be a big directory or a folder with unlimited storage in the cloud where we can store any kind of data we want. So be it structured, semi-structured or unstructured. The second type of destinations are data warehouses. Data warehouses are used specifically for analytical purposes. You know, the data that the BI engineers use or the data scientists or ML engineers use, they use data from a data warehouse. A super popular data warehouse service provider right now is Snowflake. The final type of destination is relational databases, which are essentially OLTP databases or transactional databases, such as Postgres database and SQL Server. A lot of the time, relational databases can also be a source for a data pipeline now, because many businesses have use cases to perform analytics on transactional data from their applications and OLTP databases are the core of the back end of these applications and they store that valuable transactional data and that's why a lot of the times this relational data is stored to data warehouses for analytical purposes now let's talk about the third component of a data pipeline which is transformations. Transformations are those intermediate steps that are performed on the data that is being moved by the data pipeline. The type of transformation varies widely and depends on the type of destination. For example, if the destination is a data lake, no transformation is done or sometimes very minimal transformation is done. Why? Because that's what the role of a data lake is, which is to act as an all-in-one place repository for all our raw data. Our transformations are done later by the downstream pipelines in that case. Whereas if a data pipeline's destination is a data warehouse, you'd want to do as much transformations as possible. Why? Because the data in a data warehouse is actually the finished product that is consumed by ML engineers or by BI engineers. And we want the finished product to be as much filtered, clean and precise as possible. Now, what are some typical transformations that are done on the data that's being loaded to a data warehouse? It could be something like cleaning up of the data, standardizing the data. It could be removing bad or invalid characters in the string data, standardizing the format of timestamp or dates, or standardizing numeric data, ensuring that you have the right columns and rows in the data that will be fed to a machine learning model. Or sometimes it could be mapping some data values based on certain business logic. Now, typically in the real world, it is not as simple. Your data pipeline may not be as straightforward because there could be multiple sources from which the pipeline may be extracting data. For example, you could build a pipeline that would extract data from a SQL Server database and merge it with the data from an SFTP provider's data and store it into Redshift, which is a data warehouse. Now, similarly, there could be multiple destinations to which data is being loaded. Furthermore, there could also be a number of intermediate sources and destinations in our pipeline. An example of such a data pipeline could be getting data from Google Ads API, storing it to AWS S3, and then to Snowflake or Redshift. All right, I know I've talked a lot, so now is a good time to summarize. In this video, we discussed 
data pipeline and its components that are sources, destinations, and transformations. And then we looked into some of the most common sources such as SFTP servers, API servers, webhooks or reverse APIs, and web scrape data. Next, we discussed some of the typical data destinations to which data is loaded by data engineers such as data lakes, data warehouses, and relational databases, which can also be a source. And finally, we conceptually discussed some transformations that a typical data engineer would do in his or hers day to day. Now, I'd really like to thank you for sticking around for so long. The next section is a pitch for my next video. So you do not need to watch this any further, but it's on a related topic. So please feel free to watch it. So whatever our pipeline may be doing or however it may be doing it with time in an enterprise level company or sometimes even in an SMB companies, it can get messy. Actually, it will get messy, especially if we are or our team is doing it for the very first time. From my own experiences of working in the data industry for about eight years now, and by learning from people that I've worked with in the past, I've compiled for you five simple and abstract principles we could or rather should follow when building out ETL pipelines. And that video should be out shortly. I'll put a link of that video somewhere up here at the end screen whenever it's ready. Or you could just subscribe and get notified about it proactively. If that didn't intrigue you, alternatively, you could click here to watch the video that the YouTube algorithm thinks you should watch from my channel. Thank you for watching. Until next time, peace.